Buongiorno ragazzi, and welcome to another Seeking Sushi video. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mike, and I make foodie content for content foodies like yourselves. I recently had the opportunity to visit one of the food capitals of the world, and I was far from disappointed. The region of Emilia Romagna has birthed some of the most widely used ingredients and dishes around the world. From the cities of Parma to Bologna, which is about one hour apart, you can find the origins of Parmesan cheese, balsamic vinegar, ragu bolognese, and prosciutto ham, just to name a few. And apart from these culinary staples, they are also known for being a luxury automotive hub where car manufacturers like Lamborghini and Ferrari find their roots. My five-day trip also included iconic destinations just a few hours away such as Florence and Cinque Terre, so it was definitely a jam-packed journey. All the places mentioned in the video will be displayed on the screen as I mentioned them, as well as in the description below. I've also included timestamps in case you want to skip to a specific destination as well. So with that, let's get right into it. We definitely started the trip on a high note, as we all agreed that the pizza at Pizzeria del Viale 2.0 was one of the best, if not the best, pizza we've ever had. Fittingly, I ordered the Modena Special, which encapsulated Modenese staples all into one pizza. The dough was cooked perfectly, and the amalgamation of balsamic vinegar, parmesan cheese, and prosciutto was absolutely to die for. It's a little bit outside the center, so it's not very busy, so I definitely recommend it in case you want something nice and not super touristy as well. For a comforting breakfast in the heart of the city, check out Cattedrale Pasticceria. As the name suggests, it's a pastry shop located near the main cathedral. I'm not typically a fan of food spots in the town square, but this was quite enjoyable. The must-have was definitely the gnocco frito, which is basically fried dough with prosciutto on the side, but this one was served freshly baked with the prosciutto on top. And if you have a sweet tooth, definitely grab a few with a cappuccino or espresso macchiato on the side. Just a few minutes away is a great place to grab some balsamic vinegar as a souvenir, Acetaya Giusti. The lady there spoke pretty good English and explained the differences between the varieties quite thoroughly. Their practice goes back to the 17th century, so I'd say they have a pretty good handle on balsamic vinegar. But before you commit to a purchase, you're welcome to sample them as well. I am by no means a connoisseur, but the main takeaway is that the longer the balsamic vinegar is aged, the sweeter it is. And the magic number is at least 12 years for a high quality balsamic vinegar. So you can't really go wrong if you get one at this place. And you get a nice view of the cathedral. Special shout out goes to Osteria Francescana, run by Massimo Bottura, named the best restaurant in the world in 2016 and 2018, also featured in documentaries like Chef's Table, Somebody Feed Phil, and in season two of Master of None. At the time we visited, the earliest reservation was in April 2022, and we visited in September of 2021. So it was basically impossible to get a seat during that time. So shout out to Netflix for the indoor B-roll. Check out the documentaries I just mentioned for a little taste of what's behind those exclusive doors. While our trip to Modena was limited to only a few hours, we spent the next half of the day in Parma, which is only a 30 minute train ride away. Unlike Osteria Francescana, De Pepin offers some street sandwiches that are an absolute must have. The prices are rather uniform, so you can't go wrong with whatever sandwich you choose. Its simplicity adds a layer of feel good home cooking vibes, and the prosciutto topped with the unique sauces are simply mouth watering. This is definitely a highlight if you want to bang for your buck. How was the flow? Mmm. Explain in your best in That's your best really Italian. Italian. Très très bien. Très bien. <laughs> and what's the trip to Parma without splurging on cheese? Ristorante Gallo d'Oro for us was both a hit and a little bit of a miss. We sat down between lunch and dinner, so all the tables were free, yet we were denied one of the tables because we hadn't reserved it. However, we ordered an amazing cheese platter served with a variety of spreads and tortellini on the side. Parmesan only made up a fraction of the cheese we ordered, but everyone paired really well with the toppings such as honey and balsamic vinegar, of course. The tortellini also satisfied our taste palates, and altogether, it was a pretty decent pit stop. At this point, we were surprisingly full, so we ended the night with some coffee, and we stumbled upon a place called Lino's Coffee. Assuming the guy serving us was Lino, he had quite the stern yet warm character. 
Not able to speak very good English, he urged us to speak the very, very limited Italian we had as best as we could, and he gave us great recommendations for drinks. What type of milk do you have? No, I'm Italian, I'm Italian. <laughs> While it's somewhat blasphemous to drink anything other than an espresso after 11 a.m., we experimented a little bit with some chocolate flavored and iced varieties to digest the delectable cheeses we just consumed. Stop by here if you want something a little different than an espresso. Cinque Terre is not necessarily known for the food scene, but they do have some gems. I personally recommend staying in the cities just outside the main five villages, such as La Spezia or Levanto, as they tend to get overcrowded. So we stayed in La Spezia and it was an easy train ride to the five villages from the main train station. And that's also where we started our culinary adventure. For brunch, we found this beautiful spot called Biolino, located in the center. Their interior was reminiscent of a Bali boho look with all the indoor plants lining the walls and the swings as the seats on some of their indoor tables. Apart from the interior, they have a modest assortment of pastries which weren't the most fresh but still delicious. But if you couple it with the coffee on the side, it's quite fair. Honestly, I didn't expect this place to be so good because I expected the decor to be a little bit deceiving, but the price and pastries were so good we ended up visiting twice during our trip. For a quick coffee in the city, head to Copenhagen Cafe. The baristas there are very friendly and of Dominican descent, which I then found out was quite common in La Spezia. While limited in space, the atmosphere is welcoming, perfect for a one-on-one -on -one chat or a quick espresso to go. If you're into seafood but don't want to pay the hefty price, head to La Nuova Spezia for lunch or dinner. I was positively surprised how great the seafood was at a cost of only about 10 euros. I ordered the taglioni with lobster pieces and it only cost 10 euros. I highly recommend it if you want a taste of the seafood without breaking the bank. In terms of Cinque Terre itself, there weren't that many gems I would particularly recommend. However, these are the ones I particularly enjoyed. If your long hot day ends up in Cornelia, grab a refreshing gelato or slushie at Alberto Gelateria. They have an amazing lemon basil slushie which I believe is their specialty as well as a decent assortment of ice cream. This town is more of a stroll at your own pace kind of town, so I found it more of a pit stop rather than a sit and dine kind of place. If however you are looking for the perfect place for an amazing meal with the perfect coastline view, head to Nessun Dorma in Manarola. This place was discovered on TikTok, so expect a line. You actually have to download their app, which then provides you with a number in which you will be served. Expect a wait time of about 1 to 2 hours, depending on the season. But once you're in, it does not disappoint. On TikTok, we were drawn by this massive mozzarella ball which had little mozzarella babies inside, so we had to try it. The whole platter itself consisted of 1 kilogram of mozzarella with tons of prosciutto ham, cantaloupe, and bread on the side. Which at first glance didn't seem filling, but the mozzarella just exploded with every bite. And for 50 euros across 4 people, it wasn't too bad for having so much hype. If you're looking for something a bit more low-key but still offers a nice view, stay in Manarola but head a little bit away from the sea to La Regina de Manarola. We stumbled upon this place just after lunch so we missed the food, but they have a great assortment of cocktails perfect for any time of the day. The view is stunning and as it's located on the hill, it's also rather peaceful in comparison to the more touristy areas. Founded by world-renowned barista and coffee-tasting champion, which I didn't even know existed, Francesco Sanapo and his partner Patrick Hoffer, their years of research into the perfect coffee resulted in one of the most famous cafes in Florence. Their unique coffee concoctions and inviting decor are the perfect place for coffee lovers of all sorts. I personally ordered a coffee misu, which is exactly what it sounds like, coffee with a taste of tiramisu, and it was amazing. Unfortunately, my girlfriend and I couldn't sit inside because we didn't have a green pass, which is basically their COVID pass, but I managed to snag a bag of their number 11 blend, which is the first coffee blend they used when they first opened in 2013. Florence, if you didn't know, is the home of the Renaissance movement, and this next place, Gilly, almost took me back to that time with its traditional luxurious interior. I was a little surprised by its rating on Google because the pastry I ordered was absolutely phenomenal. The packaging was great, the staff was quite friendly, and every pastry there was so beautifully and meticulously assembled. 
We only realized afterwards that there was outdoor seating, but it also seems like a great spot for brunch. Another must visit, but definitely hyped up, is Alantico Vinayo. Vinayo? Uh, sorry, if you're Italian, please forgive me for any pronunciation in this video. I'm trying my best. So, Al Antico Vinayo is a street sandwich place that's so famous that they have three different lines to queue up, and they even have security guards to guide you around. If you get a chance to try their sandwiches, they're amazing. The one I ordered had a sweet sauce, which I believe was honey, but it paired so well with the ham and cheese, I could definitely stand in line again. Honestly, you can't go wrong at this place because everything from the bread to the sauces works so well together. But if you don't want to wait in line that long, the pizza place right beside it, Pizza Napoli, is a great alternative. I was so hungry at the time that I actually ordered a pizza while waiting in line. To be honest, there was nothing special about it, but it definitely satisfied my craving. If you want to escape the crowds, head east from the center to the district of Santa Croce which was recommended by a local we actually met in Dusseldorf, who was on our flight to Bologna. He took us to one of his favorite coffee spots and gelato spots, and there were barely any tourists there. We grabbed a coffee at the Sorante Finistere, whose beauty I didn't actually fully take in until I went to the bathroom. Because there we only had coffee, but as I went indoors, it looked like an amazing place to grab dinner. Our final dinner spot on the last night of our trip in Florence was at Trattoria Ponte Vecchio. Now, typically I try to avoid restaurants along rivers because they tend to hike up prices and are often overrated. As the name suggests, it's a restaurant near Ponte Vecchio, a famous bridge that draws tourists alike and looks beautiful reflecting off the river. Here we were greeted by a warm half Filipino, half Chinese waiter attended to all of our needs. So here I was in the mood to ball out and get a steak that night. So he recommended the Florentine steak, which I can't remember the exact name of, but he said it came from a virgin cow, and that sounded pretty legit to me. It was so juicy and tender, and as I don't typically eat meat, it made me reconsider my diet choices just for that short moment. I also can't remember the name of the dessert, but it was so soft and melted so nicely. It was the perfect end to our last night in Italy. If you want a pretty standard Bolognese meal, come to Bottega Portici. Honestly, it was quite modernized which took away from the authenticity of the dishes. Like Vapiano in Germany, you are given a small device that buzzes when your food is ready, and you also order on a computer similar to that of McDonald's. However, you do see some of the people rolling the pasta in the background so you can be sure that you're getting some fresh pasta. The food itself was pricier than what it offered, but if you get the chance to sit on the terrace, you get a nice view of the Twin Towers, one of Bologna's most visited sites. Right around the corner was my favorite cafe during the whole trip, Cafe Terzi. As soon as you enter, you feel like you're traveling back in time, but in a good way. The baristas are dressed in white collars, there was somehow order in all the chaos, which I found very typical in Italy, and I ended up staring at the menu for quite some time because there were so many unique concoctions, such as an orange flavored coffee which we ended up ordering. The coffee was so good here that I bought some of their beans, specifically the blend that is apparently only known to the owner. This is definitely a must visit for any coffee lover. Another Bolognese staple is tortellini, or the belly button shaped pasta. For another traditional spot to grab some uncooked pasta or a local pastry, I highly recommend this spot. We had just eaten so we took the opportunity to grab some snacks on the go, and we were pleasantly surprised. I found this to be a common theme in traditional Italian spots order within the chaos, there were so many options to choose from, yet they were all laid out where you can see them. But that's the Italian charm I guess. Here you won't really make a dent in the wallet, so you can't really go wrong with whatever you choose. To end our short time in Bologna and our trip, we just had to have a sample of their ragu bolognese. At Osteria del Orsa, you get a pretty decent portion at a great price in my opinion. The staff are all friendly, the food is great, and the restaurant itself had a rustic yet cozy atmosphere. We ordered the lasagna and tagliatelle versions of ragu bolognese and it was so delicious. For a good value, this place is a must visit if you ever come to Bologna. Folks, that wraps up a jam-packed food tour in one of the most renowned food capitals in the world. You can either ball out in places like Osteria Francescana or give your wallet a break at the mom and pop style places. Either way, you get some dose of authenticity. 
And if you ask me what's so different about a bolognese in Bologna or Parmesan cheese in Parma, honestly, the marginal difference is very subtle. But when everything you eat is freshly made, sourced locally, and made with passion, it's these elements that are reflected in the cuisine. The places we visited offered a small glimpse of what the region has to offer, yet I was very satisfied with every spot we visited. And due to the limited time, we couldn't visit all the places we intended to visit, so I've linked all my saved spots on Google Maps in the description below. And if you took at least one thing away from this video, I encourage you to give this video a like and consider subscribing for more foodie adventures. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.